Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Earthmen vs. the Aliens The Hour of Battle by Robert Sheckley Earthmen Die Hard by Richard O. Lewis A Matter of Magnitude by Al Sevick Defence Mech by Ray Bradbury Mightiest Corn by Keith Lormer The Hour of Battle by Robert Sheckley Originally published in Space Science Fiction, September 1953 Narrated by Tom Trisser as one of the Guardian ships protecting Earth, the crew had a problem to solve. Just how do you protect a race from an enemy who can take over a man's mind without seeming effort or warning? That hand didn't move, did it? Edwison asked, standing at the port, looking at the stars. No, Morse said. He had been staring fixedly at the Atterson detector for over an hour. Now he blinked three times rapidly and looked again. Not a millimetre. I don't think it moved either, Castle added from behind the gunfire panel. And that was that. The slender black hand of the indicator rested unwaveringly on zero. The ship's guns were ready, the black mouths open to the stars. A steady hum filled the room. It came from the Addison detector, and the sound was reassuring. It reinforced the fact that the detector was attached to all the other detectors, forming a gigantic network around Earth. "'Why in hell don't they come?' Edwison asked, still looking at the stars. "'Why don't they hit?' "'Ah, shut up,' Morse said. He had a tired, glum look. High on his right temple was an old radiation burn, a sunburst of pink scar tissue. From a distance it looked like a decoration. I just wish they'd come, Edwison said. He returned from the port to his chair, bending to clear the low metal ceiling. Don't you wish they'd come? Edwison had the narrow, timid face of a mouse, but a highly intelligent mouse, one that cats did well to avoid. Don't you? he repeated. The other men didn't answer. They had settled back to their dreams, staring hypnotically at the detector face. They've had enough time, Edwardson said, half to himself. Castle yawned and licked his lips. Anyone want to play some gin? he asked, stroking his beard. The beard was a memento of his undergraduate days. Castle maintained he could store almost fifteen minutes' worth of oxygen in its follicles. He had never stepped into space unhelmeted to prove it. Morse looked away, and Edwardson automatically watched the indicator. This routine had been drilled into them, branded into their subconscious. They would as soon have cut their throats as leave the indicator unguarded. "'Do you think they'll come soon?' Edwison asked, his brown rodent's eyes on the indicator. The men didn't answer him. After two months together in space, their conversational powers were exhausted. They weren't interested in Castle's undergraduate days or in Morse's conquests. They were bored to death even with their own thoughts and dreams, bored with the attack they expected momentarily. "'Just one thing I'd like to know,' Edwardson said, slipping with ease into the old conversational gambit. "'How far can they do it?' They had talked for weeks about the enemy's telepathic range, but they always returned to it. As professional soldiers, they couldn't help but speculate on the enemy and his weapons. It was their shop talk. "'Well,' Morse said wearily, our detector network covers this system out beyond Mars's orbit. Where we sit, Castle said, watching the indicators now that the others were talking. They might not even know we have a detection unit working, Morse said, as he had said a thousand times. Oh, stop, Edwison said, his thin face twisted in scorn. The telepathic. They must have read every bit of stuff in Everset's mind. Everset didn't know we had a detection unit, Morse said, his eyes returning to the dial. 
He was captured before we had it. Look, Edwardson said, they ask him, Boy, what would you do if you knew a telepathic race was coming to take over Earth? How would you guard the planet? Idle speculation, Castle said. Maybe Everset didn't think of this. He thinks like a man, doesn't he? Everyone agreed on this defence. Everset would too. Syllogistic, Castle murmured, very shaky. I sure wish he hadn't been captured, Edwardson said. It could have been worse, Morse put in, his face sadder than ever. What if they'd captured both of them? I wish they'd come, Edwardson said. Richard Eversett and C. R. Jones had gone on the first interstellar flight. They had found an inhabited planet in the region of Vega. The rest was standard procedure. A flip of the coin had decided it. Eversett went down in the scouter, maintaining radio contact with Jones in the ship. The recording of that contact was preserved for all Earth to hear. Just met the natives, Eversett said. Funny looking bunch. Give you the physical description later. Are they trying to talk to you? Jones asked, guiding the ship in a slow spiral over the planet. No, hold it. Well, I'm damned. They're telepathic. How do you like that? Great, Jones said. Go on. Hold it. Say, Jonesy, I don't know as I like these boys. They haven't got nice minds. Brother. What is it? Jones asked, lifting the ship a little higher. Minds, these bosses are power crazy. Seems they've hit all the systems around here looking for someone to... Yeah, I've got that a bit wrong, Everset said pleasantly. They're not so bad. Jones had a quick mind, a suspicious nature and good reflexes. He set the accelerator for all the G's he could take, lay down on the floor and said, Tell me more. Come on down, Everset said, in violation of every law of space flight. These guys are all right. As a matter of fact, they're the most marvellous. That was where the recording ended. Because Jones was pinned to the floor by 20 G's acceleration as he boosted the ship to the level needed for the sea jump. He broke three ribs getting home, but he got there. A telepathic species was on the march. What was Earth going to do about it? A lot of speculation necessarily clothed the bare bones of Jones' information. Evidently, the species could take over a mind with ease. With Everset, it seemed that they had insinuated their thoughts into his, delicately altering his previous convictions. They had possessed him with remarkable ease. How about Jones? Why hadn't they taken him? Was distance a factor? Or hadn't they been prepared for the suddenness of his departure? One thing was certain. Everything Everset knew, the enemy knew. That meant they knew where Earth was, and how defenceless their planet was to their form of attack. It could be expected that they were on their way. Something was needed to nullify their tremendous advantage. But what sort of something? What armour is there against thought? How do you dodge a wavelength? Pouch-eyed scientists gravely consulted their periodic tables. And how do you know when a man has been possessed? Although the enemy was clumsy with Everset, would they continue to be clumsy? Wouldn't they learn? The psychologists tore their hair and bewailed the absence of an absolute scale for humanity. Of course, something had to be done at once. The answer, from a technological planet, was a technological one build a space fleet and equip it with some sort of detection fire network. This was done in record time. The Atterson detector was developed, a cross between radar and the electrocephalograph. Any alteration from the typical human brainwave pattern of the occupants of a detector-equipped ship would boost the indicator around the dial. Even a bad dream or a case of indigestion would jar it. It seemed probable that any attempt to take over a human mind would disturb something. There had to be a point of interaction, somewhere. That was what the Atterson detector was supposed to detect. Maybe it would. The spaceships, three men to a ship, dotted space between Earth and Mars, forming a gigantic sphere with Earth in the centre. Tens of thousands of men crouched behind gunfire panels 
watching the dials on the Addison detector, the unmoving dials. Do you think I could fire a couple of bursts? Edwison asked, his fingers on the gunfire button, just to limber the guns. Those guns don't need limbering, Castle said, stroking his beard. Besides, you'd throw the whole fleet into a panic. Castle, Morse said very quietly, get your hand off your beard. Why should I? Castle asked. Because, Morse answered, almost in a whisper, I am about to ram it right down your fat throat. Castle grinned and tightened his fists. Pleasure, he said. I'm tired of looking at that scar of yours. He stood up. Cut it, Edwardson said wearily. Watch the birdie. No reason to really, Morse said, leaning back. There's an alarm bell attached, but he looked at the dial. What if the bell doesn't work? Edwardson asked. What if the dial is jammed? How would you like something cold slithering into your mind? The dial will work, Castle said. His eyes shifted from Edwardson's face to the motionless indicator. I think I'll sack in, Edwardson said. Stick around, Castle said. Play you some gin. All right, Edwardson found and shuffled the greasy cards, while Morse took a turn glaring at the dial. I sure wish they'd come, he said. Cut, Edwardson said, handing the pack to Castle. I wonder what our friends look like, Morse said, watching the dial. Probably remarkably like us, Edwardson said, dealing the cards. Castle picked them up one by one, slowly, as if he hoped something interesting would be under them. They should have given us another man, Castle said. We could play bridge. I don't play bridge, Edwardson said. You could learn. Why didn't we send a task force? Morse asked. Why didn't we bomb their planet? Don't be dumb, Edwardson said. We'd lose any ship we'd sent. Probably get them back at us, possessed and firing. Knock with nine, Castle said. I don't give a good damn if you knock with a thousand, Edwardson said gaily. How much do I owe you now? Three million five hundred and eight thousand and ten dollars. I sure wish they'd come, Morse said. Want to write me a cheque? Take your time. Take until next week. Someone should reason with the bastards, Morse said, looking out the port. Castle immediately looked at the dial. I just thought of something, Edwardson said. Yeah? I bet it feels horrible to have your mind grabbed, Edwardson said. I bet it's awful. You'll know when it happens, Castle said. Did Everset? Probably. He just couldn't do anything about it. My mind feels fine, Castle said. But the first one of you guys start acting queer, watch out. They all laughed. Well, Edwardson said, I'd sure like a chance to reason with them. This is stupid. Why not? Castle asked. You mean go out and meet them? Sure, Castle said. We're doing no good sitting here. I should think we could do something, Edwardson said slowly. After all, they're not invincible. They're reasoning beings. Morse punched a course on the ship's tape, then looked up. You think we should contact the command, tell them what we're doing? No, Castle said, and Edwardson nodded in agreement. Red tape! We'll just go out and see what we can do. If they won't talk, we'll blast them out of space. Look! Out of the port, they could see the red flare of a reaction engine, the next ship in the sector speeding forward. They must have got the same idea, Edwardson said. Let's get there first, Castle said. Morse shoved the accelerator in, and they were thrown back in their seats. That dial hasn't moved yet, has it? Edwardson asked over the clamour of the detector alarm bell. Not a move out of it, Castle said, looking at the dial with its indicator slammed all the way over to the highest notch. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Earthman Die Hard by Richard O. Lewis Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, June 1954 
narrated by Tom Trissel. A particularly virulent germ life infested the third planet of Sol. It was obvious the world had to be decontaminated, but the aliens found Earthmen die hard. They climbed the hill together, arm in arm. At the crest they stopped and looked back into the moon-brightened valley where the thin needle of metal pointed skyward. The night wind blew her dress tightly about her slim legs, and she reached a hand to her head to keep the blonde curls from whipping about her face. He put his arm about her waist, squeezed her gently. Only a few more hours to wait, he said reassuringly. The great ship from beyond the galaxy drew alongside the tiny planet, matched its orbit, cut its drive, and drifted slightly toward the lone moon. The ship was nearly as large as the planet itself, but there was no interchange of gravity between the two bodies, for the ship was of a substance made beyond the stars. Inspector Ritt looked at his sky chart. Yes, it was Sol 3. Then he looked through the porthole at his left and adjusted the lens. Then he swore by the seven sister suns of Sagittarius. The lens showed him the moonlit side of the planet. There were lights there, little rows of lights forming checkered patterns in various areas. And there were other lights, greater lights, which flickered viciously among the patterns, leaving squat circular clouds above them. Ritt's cheeks puffed out in uncontrollable wrath. Contaminated, he bellowed, and they are warring on each other. He turned from the lens, his gross body glowing in red anger. Krembel! he screamed. Krembel! The door at the far side of the room swung open, and the entity called Krembel fluttered in. Yes? he asked, his body trembling at the manner in which his name had rung out. Your records show Sol three as sterile, decontaminated. Yes, sir, Kremble stammered. I, I took care of it myself just a few days ago. Look, shouted Inspector Ritt. Look for yourself. Kremble went hesitantly to the lens and adjusted himself before it. He saw the sparkling lights below, the flashes, the tiny clouds, and his body went pale pink with a shame of defeat. I, I am sorry, sir, he turned from the instrument, his pale pink fading to an ashen grey. I just don't understand it. I have renovated the planet several times. Several times? Why, yes, Kremble hurried to a shelf of documents along one wall, scanned the titles briefly, selected one, and returned to the desk. Here it is, sir. You will find my reports quite in order, sir. "'Damn the reports!' snapped the inspector. "'I want to know why this planet hasn't been cared for properly!' He darkened his body with a scowl. Kremble fumbled the document open, flipped a few pages. "'Here it is, sir. All written down, sir. All in correct order, sir. "'Cosmos 66, 9238, he read. "'Malignant growth noted. "'Cosmos 67, 9238, decontamination process begun. "'Method. Entire planet encircled with electrical impulses which caused hydrogen and oxygen to unite into a heavy liquid. Process continued for a full forty of planet's revolutions. Result. Planet covered with a liquid to an average depth of thirty fathoms. Contaminating element, being oxygen breathing, could not possibly exist under such conditions. Fool! barked Ritt. Some of them probably floated to the surface on some of the buoyant vegetation. They might even have made rafts of the vegetation. Or a boat! They are exceedingly persistent and adaptable, sir, Kremble admitted. And there were other times... He broke off to fumble through the documented account. Yes, here it is, all written down in correct form. Damn the reports, snapped the inspector. Tell me what happened. Well, sir, said Kremble, scanning the pages carefully. It was back in 9237. I noticed the malignancy and took proper measures. I took the planet from its orbit and into an area remote from the Sol unit. There, in the intense cold, the polar caps grew larger and larger until they finally extended over the land portions. Even the middle belt became frigid. Then I swung the planet back near Sol and let it soak in tropical heat. I subjected the planet to this treatment three, or was it four, times before placing it back permanently in its orbit. Dolt, said Ritt. 
They probably hid away in deep crevices, probably remained alive through the treatment by eating each other. He looked at the unhappy Kremble for a devastating minute. You should have used fire. Burn them out. But I did, sir, Kremble said hurriedly. I did. He fumbled rapidly through the pages. Here it is, right here, all written out. Nebula 42, 92, 35. Persistence of malignant contamination noted. He broke off abruptly as the inspector's body turned to brittle obsidian. Mm, ah, well, sir, finding them confined in an area of particularly lush vegetation, I burned them out, chased them with fire into arid regions, and swept the garden of plant growth completely away where they could not find it again. But it is obvious that you failed, even if two of them succeeded in escaping. And before that, sir, Kremble hurried on, before that I shook the land masses violently, rent great fissures that permitted the gases and flames to leap out from the central core and spread destruction. I submerged huge infected areas into the depths of the seas and brought up new land masses, fresh and clean, into the light of Sol. I even... Enough! Enough! Rit hit the desk before him, a ponderous blow. Silence, fool, while I think... Kremble turned a sickly shade of green and let the document close in weary hands. Sol three had been a particularly painful lancet in his side, even more so than had yet been guessed. He hoped the inspector would probe no deeper, but even as his hopes kindled, they became but ashes. There are a few more things I do not understand about this, Inspector Rich was saying. When this planet was formed from the elements of space, there was no contamination. It was virgin. And yet it is now contaminated. Why? Kremble felt his innards churning fearfully. His whole body was so filled with trembling that he could not bring himself to fashion words. Ritz's body grew blacker in the silence. Why? The word was lightning from the Stygian depths. Why? Kremble's body rent asunder, and the effort of re himself so weakened him that his voice was scarcely a whisper. They... they came from Sol Five, sir. The thunderous blow upon the desktop mingled with Ritz's bellow of fury. Together the sounds shook the room and nearly disintegrated Kremble's hastily reassembled body. Dolt! Ass! screamed Ritt his body assuming the blackness of the dust cloud of Orion. You failed to stop them on Sol 5? You not only let them blow the planet into tiny bits, but you also let them escape to Sol 3, and here all your efforts of extermination have failed again and again. He wheeled to look through the lens again. Three brilliant flashes, greater than the others, sparkled almost simultaneously upon the planet's troubled surface, sent up mushrooms of dust in shattered atoms. And is this what happened on Sol 5? Yes, stammered Kremble. The same thing, just before, just before. He could not bring himself to complete the statement. Rit leapt from the seat at the desk, his body black and bloated. Then there is not a moment to lose. Exterminate before this planet is destroyed, and let none escape. But, sir, pleaded Kremble, I have tried everything. Fire, floods, ice. Then try something else, Rit roared. Kremble drifted slowly towards the door. Wait! Kremble stopped obediently. What about Sol 4? Oh, Sol 4 is all right, sir, Kremble brightened a shade as he turned. There is not the slightest trace of contamination. That planet must have been on the far side of Sol when, when they escaped Sol 5. I am certain, sir, you will find the rest of the system quite in order. Enough! Begin the extermination, and this time employ drastic measures. Take the planet to the rim of Sol itself and bake it to a crisp before they infest the entire galaxy. Yes, sir, immediately, sir. Kremble turned again to the floor, thankful his fate had not been worse. And don't fail this time, warned Rit. If you lose Sol 3 as you lost Sol 5, I'll see to it that you put them both back together again, piece by piece, if it takes you six eons beyond your retirement age. 
The moon, with its strange accompanying cloud, had nearly set. The blue of the eastern sky was fading into apple green. There was a roaring swish of sound, a shattering blast of energy, a whistling sigh, then a remote whisper. The needle-like structure from the valley became a flickering pinpoint in the sky. The girl leaned her blonde head against the shoulder of the man beside her. We... we are free? Her voice was but a whisper. He adjusted the ravis to get a clearer view of earth and its surrounding space. The view was but slightly distorted by the hot gases of the stern tubes. Yes, he said, struggling to keep his nervousness from playing havoc with his vocal cords. Free, free from a mad world. He squeezed her hand reassuringly, his eyes intent upon the screen. Something had gone wrong. The earth had slid to one edge of the screen. He readjusted the ravis. The space cloud of black that had hovered near the moon that night had also shifted its position. It was now between the earth and the sun, and the earth seemed to be following it. The furrow between his dark brows deepened, but he said nothing. Just think of it, she said, her voice a song. Mars and a brave new world! He put an arm about her shoulders and took his eyes from the screen. It was absurd to think the earth was moving sunward. It was probably merely due to some space aberration. Yes, he said, picking up her enthusiasm. And after that, the stars. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. A Matter of Magnitude by Al Sevick Originally published in Amazing Science Fiction Stories, January 1960 Narrated by Tom Trissel The ship, for reasons that had to do with politics of appropriations, was named Senator Joseph L. Holloway, but the press and the public called her Big Joe. Her captain, Six Star Admiral Hesselton, thought of her as Great Big Joe, and never fully got over being awestruck at the size of his command. "'She's a mighty big ship, Rogers,' he said proudly to the navigator, ignoring the latter's rather vacant stare and fixed smile. "'More than a mile long, and wider than hell,' he waved his hands expansively. "'She's never touched down on earth, you know. Never will. Too big for that.' They built her on the moon. The cost, well... Swiveling his chair around, Hesselton slowly surveyed the ship's control room with a small, satisfied smile. The two pilots, sitting far forward, almost hidden by their banks of instruments, the radar operators idly watching their scopes, the three flight engineers sitting intently at their enormous control consoles, and just behind the radio shack, its closed door undoubtedly hiding a game of cards. For weeks now, as Big Joe moved across the galaxy's uncharted fringe, the radio bands had been completely dead, except, of course, for the usual star static hissing and burbling in the background. Turning back again to his navigator, Hesselton smiled modestly and noted that Big Joe was undisputedly the largest, most powerful, most feared and most effective spaceship in the known universe. As always, Roger nodded agreement. The fact that he'd heard it a hundred times didn't make it any less true. Big Joe, armed with every weapon known to Terran technology, was literally the battleship to end all battleships. Ending battleships, and battles, was, in fact, her job. And she did it well. For the first time, the galaxy was at peace. With a relaxed sigh, Hesselton leaned back to gaze at the stars and contemplate the vastness of the universe, compared to which even Big Joe was an insignificant dot. Well, said Rogers, time for another course check. I'll... He jumped back, barely avoiding the worried lieutenant who exploded upon them from the radio shack, a signal, sir. Damn close, on the VHF brand. The transmission is completely overriding the background noise. 
He waved excitedly to someone in the radio shack, and an overhead speaker came to life, emitting a distinct clacking grunting sound. It's audio of some sort, sir, but there's lots more to the signal than that. In one motion, Heselton's chair snapped forward. His right fist hit the red emergency alert button on his desk, and his left snapped on the ship's intercom. Lights dimmed momentarily as powerful emergency drive units snapped into action, and the ship echoed with the sound of two thousand men running to battle stations. Bridge to radar, report. Radar to bridge, all clear. Heselton stared incredulously at the intercom. What? Radar to bridge, repeating. All clear. Admiral, we've got two men on every scope. There's nothing anywhere. A new voice cut in on the speaker. Radio track to bridge. Frowning, Heselton answered. Bridge, come in, radio track. We're listening. Sir, the crisp voice of the radio track section's commander had an excited tinge. Sir, Doppler calculations show that the source of those signals is slowing down somewhere to our right. It's acting like a spaceship, sir, that's coming to a halt. The Admiral locked eyes with Rogers for a second, then shrugged. Slow the ship and circle right. Radio track, can you keep me posted on the object's position? No can do, sir. Doppler effects can't be used on a slow-moving source. It's still too off to our right, but that's the best I can say. Sir, another voice chimed in. This is fire control. We've got our directional antennas on the thing. It's either directly right or directly left of the ship, matching speed with us exactly. Either to our right or left? That's the best we can do, sir, without radar help. Admiral, sir, the lieutenant who had first reported the signal came running back. Judging from the frequency and strength, we think it's probably less than a hundred miles away. Less than a hundred? Of course, we can't be positive, sir. Heselton whirled back to the intercom. Radar! That thing is practically on our necks! What the hell's the matter with that equipment? The radar commander's voice showed distinct signs of strain. Can't help it, Admiral. The equipment is working perfectly. We tried the complete range of frequencies. Twenty-five different sets are in operation. We're going blind, looking. There's absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. For a moment, the bridge was silent, except for the clacking grunting from the overhead speaker, which, if anything, sounded louder than before. It's TV, sir, the radio lieutenant came running in again. We unscrambled the image. Here! The communication screen on Heselton's desk glowed for a moment, then flashed into life. The figure was clearly alien, though startlingly humanoid, at least from the waist up, which was all that showed in the screen. A large mouth and slightly bulging eyes gave it a somewhat jovial, frog-like demeanour. Seated at a desk similar to Heselton's, wearing a gaudy uniform profusely strewn with a variety of insignia, it was obviously Heselton's counterpart, the commander of an alien vessel. Hmm, looks like we've contacted a new race. Let's return the call, Lieutenant. A tiny red light glowed beneath a miniature camera on Heselton's desk, and almost at once the alien's face registered obvious satisfaction. It waved a six-fingered hand in an unorthodox but friendly greeting. Heselton waved back. The alien then pointed to his mouth, made several clacking grunting sounds, and moved a hand on his desk. The scene switched to another alien standing in front of what looked like a blackboard, with a piece of chalk in his hand. The meaning was clear. Lieutenant, have this transmission switched to the linguistic section. Maybe those guys can work some sort of language. The screen blanked out. Heselton leaned back, tense, obviously worried. Hesitantly, he reached out and touched a button on the intercom. Astronomy? Professor, there's a ship right next door somewhere that should stand out like King Kong in a kindergarten. I know, Admiral. I've been listening to the intercom. Our optical equipment isn't designed for close-range work, but we've been doing the best we can, tried everything from infrared through ultraviolet. If there is a ship out there, I'm afraid it's invisible. Beads of sweat sprinkled Heselton's forehead. This is bad, Rogers, mighty bad. Nervously, he walked across to the right of the bridge and stood, hands clasped behind his back, staring blankly out at blackness and the scattered stars. I know there is a ship out there, and I know that a ship simply can't be invisible, not to radar and optics. 
What makes you sure there is only one, sir? Heselton cracked his fists together. My God, Rogers, you're right. There might be. The intercom clacked. This is fire control again, sir. I think we've got something on the radiation detectors. Good work. What did you find? Slight radioactivity. Typical of interstellar drive mechanisms. Somewhere off to our right. Can't tell exactly where, though. How far away is it? I don't know, sir. Heselton's hands dropped to his sides. Thanks, he said, for the help. His desk TV flashed into life with a picture of the smiling alien commander. This is the linguistic section, Admiral. The aliens understand a fairly common galactic symbology. I believe we can translate simple messages for you now. Ask him where the hell he is, Esselton snapped without thinking, then instantly regretted it as the alien's face showed unmistakable surprise. The alien's smile grew into an almost unbelievable grin. He turned sideways to speak to somewhere out of sight of the camera, and suddenly burst into a series of roaring cackles. He's laughing, sir, the translator commented unnecessarily. The joke was strictly with the aliens. Heselton's face whitened in quick realizations. Rogers, they didn't know that we can't see them. Look, sir, the navigator pointed to the TV screen and a brilliantly clear image of Big Joe shimmering against the galaxy, lit by millions of stars. Every missile port... Even the military numerals along her nose were clearly visible. They're rubbing it in, Rogers, showing us what we look like to them. Heselton's face was chalk. They could blast Big Joe apart piece by piece, the most powerful ship in the galaxy. Maybe, said Rogers, the second most powerful. Without answering, Heselton turned and looked out again at the empty space and millions of steady, unwinking stars. His mind formed an image of a huge ethereal spaceship, missile ports open, weapons aimed directly at Big Joe. The speaker interrupted his nightmare. This is fire control, Admiral. With your permission, I'll scatter a few sea bombs. Heselton leaped for the microphone. Are you out of your mind? We haven't the slightest idea of the forces that guy has. We might be in the centre of a whole blooming fleet. Ever think of that? The alien's face, still smirking, appeared again on the screen. He says, said the interpreter, that he finds the presence of our armed ship very annoying. Heselton knew what he had to do. Tell him, he said, swallowing hard, that we apologise. This part of the galaxy is strange to us. He says he is contemplating blasting us out of the sky. Heselton said nothing, but he longed to reach out and throttle the grinning alien face. However, the interpreter continued, he will let us go safely if we leave immediately. He says to send an unarmed diplomatic vessel next time, and maybe his people will talk to us. Thank him for his kindness. Heselton's jaws clenched so tightly they ached. He says, said the interpreter, to get the hell out. The grinning face snapped off the screen, but the cackling laughter continued to reverberate in the control room until the radio shack finally turned off the receiver. Reverse course, the Admiral ordered quietly. Maximum drive. A thousand missile launchers designed to disintegrate solar systems, were deactivated. Hundreds of gyros swung the mile-long ship end for end and stabilised her on a reverse course. Drive units big enough to power several major cities wind into operation. Anti-grav generators with the strength to shift small planets counterbalanced the external acceleration and the ship moved away with a speed approaching that of light. Well, muttered Heselton, that's the very first time Big Joe has ever had to retreat. As if it were his own personal failure, he walked slowly across the control room and down the corridor towards his cabin. Admiral! Lost in thought, Heselton barely heard the call. Admiral, look! Pausing at the door to his cabin, Heselton turned to face the ship's chief astronomer running up waving two large photographs. 
Look, sir, the professor gasped for breath. We thought this was a spot on the negative, but one of the men got curious and enlarged it about a hundred times. He held up one of the photos. It showed a small, fuzzy, but unmistakable spaceship. No wonder we couldn't spot it with our instruments. Heselton snatched it out of his hand. I see what you mean. This ship must have been thousands of miles. The professor shook his head. No, sir. As a matter of fact, it was quite close by. But we figure that the total length of the alien ship was roughly an inch and a half. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Defence Mech by Ray Bradbury Originally published in Planet Stories, Spring 1946 Narrated by Tom Tillerson Oh my God, do you realise how far from Earth we are? Do you really think about it? It's enough to scare the guts from a man. Hold me up. Do something. Give me sedatives or hold my hand or call, run, call Mama. A million cold miles up. See all the flickering stars. Look at my hands tremble. Feel my heart whirling like a hot pinwheel. The captain comes toward me. A stunned expression on his small, tight face. He takes my arm, looking into my eyes. Hello, Captain. I'm sick, if that's what you want to know. I have a right to be scared. Just look at all that space. Standing here a moment ago, I stared down at Earth so round and cloud-covered and asleep on a mat of stars, and my brain tore loose and screamed, Man, man, how did you get in a mess like this, in a rocket a million miles past the moon? shooting for Mars with a crew of fourteen others. I can hardly stand up. My knees, my hands, my heart are shaking apart. Hold me up, sir. What are hysterics like? The captain unprongs the interdeck audio and speaks swiftly, scowling into it. I hope he's phoning the psychiatrist. I need something. Oh, damn it, damn it. The psychiatrist descends the ladder in immaculate salt-white uniform, and walks toward me in a dream. Hello, Doctor. You're the one for me. Please, sir, turn this damned rocket around and fly back to New York. I'll go crazy with all this space and distance. The psychiatrist and the captain's voices murmur and blend, with here and there an emphasis, a toss of head, a gesture. Young Holloway's here on the fear jag, Doctor. Can you help him? I'll try. Good man Holloway is. Imagine you'll need him and his muscles when we land. With a crew as small as it is, every man's worth his weight in uranium. He's got to be cured. The psychiatrist shakes his head. Might have to squirt him full of drugs to keep him quiet for the rest of the expedition. The captain explodes, saying that is impossible. Blood drums in my head. The doctor moves closer smelling clean, sharp, and white. "'Please understand, Captain. This man is definitely psychotic about going home. His talk is almost a reversion to childhood. I can't refuse his demands, and his fear seems too deeply based for reasoning. However, I think I've an idea. Halloway?' "'Yes, sir. Help me, Doctor. I want to go home. I want to see popcorn exploding into a buttered avalanche inside the glass cube.' I want to roller skate. I want to climb into the old cool wet ice wagon and go chick 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 on the ice with a sharp pick. I want to take long sweating hikes in the country, see big brick buildings and bright faced people, fight the old gang, anything but this awful. The psychiatrist rubs his chin. All right, son, you can go back to Earth now tonight. Again the captain explodes. You can't tell him that. We're landing on Mars today. The psychiatrist pats down the captain patiently. Please, Captain. Well, Halloway, back to New York for you. How does it sound? I'm not so scared now. We're going down on the moving ladder, and here is the psychiatrist's cubicle. He's pouring lights into my eyes. 
They revolve like stars on a disc. Lots of strange machines around, attachments to my head, my ears. Sleepy, oh so sleepy, like under warm water, being pushed around, laved, washed, quiet. Oh gosh, sleepy. Listen to me, Halloway. Sleepy, doctors talking, very soft, like feathers, soft, soft. You're going to land on Earth. No matter what they tell you, you're landing on Earth. No matter what happens, you'll be on Earth. Everything you see and do will be like on Earth. Remember that. Remember that. You won't be afraid, because you'll be on Earth. Remember that. Over and over, you'll land on Earth in an hour. Home. Home again. No matter what anyone says. Oh, yes, sir. Home again. Sleepy. Home again. Drifting. Sleeping. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you from the bottom of my drowsy, sleepy soul. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sleepy. Drifting. I'm awake. Hey, everybody, come look. Here comes Earth. Right at us, like a green moss ball off a bat, coming at us on a curve. Check stations. Mars landing. Get into bulges. Test atmosphere. Get into your what, did he say? Your baseball uniform, Holloway. Your baseball uniform. Yes, sir. My baseball uniform. Where did I put it? Over here. Head into, legs into, feet into it. There. Ha, ah, this is great. Picture in here, old boy. Old boy, smack, yow. Yes, sir, it's over there in that metal locker. I'll take it out. Head, arms, legs into it. I'm dressed. Baseball uniform. Ha, this is great. Picture in here, old boy. Old boy, smack, yow. Adjust bulger helmets. Check oxygen. What? Put on your catcher's mask, Holloway. Ah, the mask slides down over my face, like that. The captain comes rushing up, eyes hot green and angry. Doctor, what's this infernal nonsense? You wanted Holloway able to do his work, didn't you, Captain? Yes, but what the hell have you done to him? Strange. As they talk, I hear the words flow over my head like it's a wave dashed on a sea stone. But the words drain off, leaving no imprint. As soon as some words invade my head, something eats and digests them, and I think the words are something else entirely. The psychiatrist nods at me. I couldn't change his basic desire. Given time, yes, a period of months, I could have, but you need him now. So against all the known ethics of my profession, which say one must never lie to a patient, I have followed along in his own thought channel. I didn't dare frustrate him. He wanted to go home, so I let him. I've given him a fantasy. I've set up a protective defence mechanism in his mind that refuses to believe certain realities, that evaluates all things from his own desire for security and home. His mind will automatically block any thought or image that endangers that security. The captain stares wildly. Then, then Holloway's insane. Would you have him mad with fear, or able to work on Mars hindered by only a slight touched condition? Coddle him, and he'll do fine. Just remember, we're landing on Earth, not Mars. Earth, Mars, you'll have me raving next. The doctor and the captain certainly talk weirdly. Who cares? Here comes Earth, green, expanding like a moist cabbage underfoot. Mars landing. Airlock opened. Use bulger oxygen. Here we go, gang. Last one out as a pink chimpanzee. Holloway, come back, you damn fool. You'll kill yourself. Feel the good sweet earth. Home again. Praise the Lord. Let's dance. Sing off key. Laugh. Ha, ho, oh boy. In the door of the house stands the captain, his face red and wrinkled, waving his fists. 
Holloway, come back. Look behind you, you fool. I whirl about and cry out happily. Shep, Shep, old dog, he comes running to meet me. Long fur, shining amber in the sunshine. Barking, Shep, I haven't seen you in years. Good old pooch. Come here, Shep, let me pet you. The captain shrieks. Don't pet it. It looks like a carnivorous Martian worm. Man, the jaws on that thing. Halloway, use your knife. Shep snarls and shows his teeth. Shep, what's wrong? That's no way to greet me. Come on, Shep. Hey. I pull back my fingers as his swift jaws snap. Shep circles me swiftly. You haven't rabies, have you, Shep? He darts in, snatches my ankle with strong locking white teeth. Lord, Shep, you're crazy. I can't let this go on. I knew you used to be such a fine, beautiful dog. Remember all the hikes we looked took into the lazy corn country by the red barns and deep wells? Shep clenches tight my ankle. I'll give him one more chance. Shep, let go. Where did this long knife come from in my hand like magic? Sorry to do this, Shep, but there. Shep screams, thrashing screams again. My arm pumps up and down. My glove are freckled with blood flakes. Don't scream, Shep. I said I was sorry, didn't I? Get out there, you men, and bury that beast immediately. I glare at the captain. Don't talk that way about Shep. The captain stares at my ankle. Sorry, Holloway. I meant bury that dog, you men. Give him full honours. You were lucky, son. Another second and those knife-teeth bored through your ankle-cuff metal. I don't know what he means. I'm wearing sneakers, sir. Oh, yeah, so you are. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Halloway. I know how you must feel about... Shep. He was a fine dog. I think about it a moment, and my eyes fill up, wet. There'll be a picnic and a hike, the captain says. Three hours now the boys have carried luggage from the metal house. The way they talk, this'll be some picnic. Some seem afraid, but who worries about copperheads and water moccasins and crawfish? Not me, no sir, not me. Gus Bartz, sweating beside me on some apparatus, squints at me. What's eating you, Halloway? I smile. Me, nothing, why? You and that act with that Martian worm. What are you talking about? What worm? The captain interrupts nervously. Bartz, lay off Halloway. The doctor will explain why. Ask him. Bartz goes away, scratching his head. The captain pats my shoulder. You're a strong arm man, Halloway. You've got muscles from working on the rocket engines. So keep alert today, eh? On your hike to look over the territory, keep your... BB gun, ready. Beavers, do you think, sir? The captain swallows hard and blinks. Er, uh, oh, beavers, yeah, beavers, sure. Beavers, maybe. Mountain lions and Indians, too, I hear. Never can tell. Be careful. Mountain lions and Indians in New York in this day and age? Oh, sir. Let it go. Keep alert, anyhow. Smoke? I don't smoke, sir. A strong mind and a healthy body. You know the old rule. The old rule. Oh, yes, the old rule. Only joking. I don't want to smoke anyway, like hell. What was that last, sir? Uh, nothing, Holloway. Carry on, carry on. I help the others work now. Are we taking the yellow street car to the edge of town, Gus? We're using propulsion belts, skimming low over the Dead Seas. How's that again, Gus? I said, we're taking the yellow street car through the end of the line, yeah. We're ready. Everyone's packed, spreading out. We're going in groups of four. Down Main Street, past the pie factory, over the bridge, through the tunnel, past the circus grounds, and we rendezvous, says the captain, at a place he points to on a queer disjointed map. Whoosh! We're off! I forgot to pay my fare! That's okay. I paid it. Thanks, Captain. We're really travelling. The cypresses and the maples flash by. Quawoom! I wouldn't admit this to anyone, but you, sir, 
but momentarily. There, I didn't see the street car. Suddenly we moved an empty space, nothing supporting us, and I didn't see any car. But now I see it, sir. The captain gazes at me at a nine-day miracle. You do, eh? Yes, sir. I clutch upward. Here's the strap. I'm holding it. You look pretty funny sliding through the air with your hand up like that, Halloway. How's that, sir? Ha, ha, ha. Why are the others laughing at me, sir? Nothing, son, nothing. Just happy, that's all. Ding, 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 ding. Canal Street in Washington. Ding, ding, whoosh. This is real travelling. Funny, though. The captain and his men keep moving, changing seats, never stay seated. It's a long street car. I'm way in back now. They're up front. By the large brown house on the next corner stands a popcorn wagon, yellow and red and blue. I can taste the popcorn in my mind. It's been a long time since I've eaten some. If I ask the captain's permission to stop and buy a bag, he'll refuse. I'll just sneak off the car at the next stop. I can get back on the next car and catch up with the gang later. How do you stop this car? My fingers fumble with my baseball outfit, doing something I don't want to know about. The car is stopping. Why is that? Popcorn is more important. I'm off the car, walking. Here's the popcorn machine with a man behind it, fussing with little silver metal knobs. Brr, lock, lock, corris. Tony, Tony Bambino, what are you doing here? Click. It can't be, but it is. Tony, who died ten long years ago, when I was a freckled kid, alive and selling popcorn again. Oh, Tony, it's good to see you. His black moustache is so waxed, so shining, his dark hair like burnt oily shavings, his dark shining happy eyes, his smiling red cheeks. He shimmers in my eyes like in a cold rain. Tony, let me shake your hand. Give me a bag of popcorn, senor. Click, 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 spat, click. Ree! The captain didn't see you, Tony. You were hidden so well. Only I saw you. Just a moment while I search for my nickel. Ree! Woo, I'm dizzy. It's very hot. My head spins like a leaf on a storm wind. Let me hold on to your wagon, Tony. Click. I'm shivering. And I've got sharp needle-head pains. Ree! I'm running a temperature. I feel as if I had a torch hung flaming in my head. Hotter. Pardon me for criticising you, Tony, but I think it's your popper turned up to you high. Your face looks afraid, contorted, and your hands move so rapidly. Why? Can't you shut it off? I'm hot. Everything melts. My knees sag. Warmer still. You'd better turn that thing off. I can't take any more. I can't find my nickel anyhow. Please snap it off, Tony. I'm sick. My uniform glows orange. I'll take fire. Here, I'll turn it off for you, Tony. You hit me. Stop hitting me. Stop clicking those knobs. It's hot, I tell you. Stop or I'll... Tony, where are you? Gone. Where did that purple flame shoot from? That loud blast... What was it? The flame seemed to stream from my hand, out of my scout flashlight. Purple flame eating. I smell a sharp, bitter odour, like hamburger fried over long. I feel better now, cool as winter, but... Like a fly buzzing in my ears, a voice comes faint, far off. Halloway! Damn it! Halloway, where are you? Captain, it's his voice sizzling. I don't see you, sir. Halloway, we're on the Dead Sea bottom near an ancient Martian city at... Uh, oh, never mind, damn it. If you hear me, press your Boy Scout badge and yell. I press the badge intensely, sweating. Hey, Captain. Halloway, glory, you're not dead. Where are you? I stopped for popcorn, sir. I can't see you. How do I hear you? It's an echo. Let it go. If you're OK, grab the next street car. That's very opportune, because here comes a big red street car now, around the corner of the drug store. What? Yes, sir, and it's chock full of people. I'll climb aboard. 
Wait a minute. Hold on. Murder. What kind of people, damn it? That's the West Side Gang. Sure, the whole bunch of tough kids. West Side Gang. Hell, those are Martians. Get the hell out of there. Transfer to another car. Take the subway. Take the elevated. Too late. The car's stopped. I'll have to get on. The conductor looks impatient. Impatient, he says. You'll be massacred. Uh-oh. Everybody's climbing from the streetcar, looking angry at me. Kelly and Grogan and Tompkins and the others. I guess there'll be a fight. The captain's voice stabs at my ears. But I don't see him anywhere. Use your argon, your blaster, your blaster. Hell, use your slingshot or throw spitballs, whatever the devil you imagine you got holstered there. But use it. Come on, men, about face and back. I'm outnumbered. I bet they'll gang me and give me the bumps, the bumps, the bumps. I bet they'll trust me to a maple tree, maple tree, maple tree, and tickle me. I bet they'll ink tattoo their initials on my forehead. Mother won't like this. The captain's voice opens up louder, driving nearer. And Papa ain't happy. Get out of there, Halloway. They're hitting me, sir. We're battling. Keep it up, Halloway. I knocked one down, sir, with an uppercut. I'm knocking another down now. Here goes a third. Someone's grabbed my ankle. I'll kick him. There. I'm stumbling, falling, lights in my eyes. Purple ones. Big purple lightning bolts sizzling in the air. Three of them vanished just like that. I think they fell down a manhole. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt them bad. They stole my flashlight. Get it back, Halloway. We're coming. Get your flash and use it. That's silly. Silly, he says. Silly, silly. I got my flashlight back. Broken. No good. We're wrestling. There are so many of them. I'm weak. They're climbing all over me, hitting. It's not fair. I'm falling down, kicking, screaming. Up, speed men, full power. They're binding me up. I can't move. They're rushing me into the streetcar now and I won't be able to go on that hike, and I planned on it so hard, too. Here we are, Halloway. Blast them, men. Oh, my Lord, look at the horrible faces on those creatures. Gah! Watch out, Captain. They'll get you, too, and the others. Ah! Somebody struck me on the back of my head. Darkness, dark, dark. Rocky bye, baby, on the treetop, when the wind blows. OK, Halloway, any time. Just any old time you want to come to. Dark. A voice talking. Dark as a whale's insides. Ouch, my head. I'm flat on my back. I can feel rocks under me. Good morning, dear Mr. Halloway. That you, Captain, over in that dark corner? It ain't the President of the United States. Where is this cave? Suppose you tell us you got us into this mess with your eternally blasted popcorn. Why'd you get off the streetcar? Did the West Side Gang truss us up like this, Captain? West Side Gang? Gah! These faces, those inhuman, weird, unsavory, and horrible faces, all loose, fleshed, and gangrenous. Aliens, the whole rotting clutch of them. What a funny way to talk. Listen, you parboiled idiot. In about an hour, we're going to be fried, gutted, iced, killed, slaughtered, murdered. We will be, ipso facto, dead. Your friends are whipping up a little bloodletting jamboree. Can't I shove it through your thick skull? We're on Mars, about to be sliced and hammered by a lousy bunch of Martians. Captain, sir. Yes, Berman. The cave door's opening, sir. I think the Martians are ready to have at us again, sir. Some sort of test or other, no doubt. Let go of me, you one-eyed monster. I'm coming. Don't push. We're outside the cave. They're cutting our bonds. See, Captain, they aren't hurting us after all. Here's the brick alley. There's Mrs. Haight's underwear waving on the clothesline. See all the people from the beer hall. What are they waiting for? To see us die. Captain, what's wrong with Holloway? He's acting queer. At least he's better off than us. He can't see these creatures' faces and bodies. It's enough to turn a man's stomach. This must be their amphitheatre. 
that looks like an obstacle course. I gather from their sign lingo that if we make it through the obstacles, we're free. Footnote. Nobody's ever gotten through alive yet. Seems they want you to go first, Berman. Good luck, boy. So long, Captain. So long, Gus. So long, Halloway. Berman's running down alley with an easy, long-muscled stride. I hear him yelling high and clear, even though he's getting far away. Here comes an automobile. Berman! Oh, it hit him! He's fallen. Berman, get up! Get up! Stay here, Halloway. It's not your turn yet. My turn? What do you mean? Someone's got to help Berman. Halloway, come back. Oh, man, I don't want to see this. I lift up my legs, put them down. Breathe out, breathe in, swing arms, swing legs, chew my tongue, blink my eyes. Berman, here I come. Gee, things are crazy funny. Here comes an ice wagon trundling along. It's coming right at me. I can't see to get around it. It's coming so fast. I'll jump inside it. Jump, jump, cool ice. I speak chick, chick, chick. I hear the captain screaming off a million hot miles gone. Chick, chick, chick. Around the ice perimeter, the ice wagon is thundering, rioting, jouncing, shaking, rolling on big rusty iron wheels, smelling of sour ammonia, bouncing on a corduroy dirt and brick alley road. The rear end of it seems to be snapping shut with many ice prongs. I feel intense pain in my left leg. Chick, 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 chick. Piece of ice, cold square, cold cube, a shuddering and convulsing, a trembler. The wagon wheels stop rolling. I jump down and run away from the wrecked wagon. Did the wagon roll over Berman? I hope not. A fence here, I'll jump over it. Another popcorn machine, very warm, very hot, all flame and red fire and burning metal knobs. Oops, I didn't mean to strike the popcorn man down. Hello, Berman, what are you doing in my arms? How'd you get here? Did I pick you up? And why? An obstacle race at the high school. You're heavy, I'm tired, dogs nipping at my heels. How far am I supposed to carry you? I hear the captain screaming me on. For why? For why? Here comes the big bad truant officer with a club in his hands to take me back to school. He looks mean and broad. I kick the truant officer's shins and kicked him in the face. Mama won't like that. Yes, mummy. No, mummy. That's unfair. It's not ethical fighting. Something went squish. Hmm. Let's forget about it, shall we? Breathing hard. Here comes the gang after me, all the rough, bristly Irishmen and scarred Norwegians and stubborn Italians. Hit, kick, wrestle. Here comes a swift car. Fast, fast. I hope I can duck. With you, Berman. Here's another. Car from the opposite way. If I work things right, mm, stop screaming, Berman. The cars crashed into each other. The cars still roll, tumbling, like two animals tearing at each other's throats. Not far to go now, Berman, to the end of the alley, just ahead. I'll sleep for forty years when this is over. Where'd I get this flashlight in my hand? From one of those guys I knocked down. From the popcorn man. I'll poke it in front of me. People run away. Maybe they don't like its light in their eyes. The end of the alley. There's the green valley in my house, and there's Mum and Pop waiting. Hey, let's sing. Let's dance. We're going home. Halloway! You so-and-so. You did it. Dark. Sleep. Wake up slow. Listen. And Holloway ran down that amphitheatre nonchalant as a high school kid jumping hurdles. A big saffron Martian beast with a mouth so damn big it looked like the rear end of a delivery truck lunged forward square at Holloway. What did Holloway do? Holloway jumped right inside the monster's mouth. Right inside. What happened then? The animal looked dumbfounded. It tried to spit out. Then, to top it all, what did Holloway do, I ask you? I ask you, what did he do? He drew forth his Boy Scout blade and went chick-chick-chick all around the bloody interior, pretending like he's holed up in an ice wagon, chipping himself off pieces of ice. No! On my honour, the monster, after taking a bit of this chick-chick-chick business, leapt around, cavorting, floundering, rocking, tossing, and then, with a spout of blood, out popped Holloway, grinning like a kid, and on he ran, dodging spears and pretending they were pebbles, leaping a line of crouched warriors and saying they're on picket fence. Then he lifted Berman and trotted with him until he met a three-hundred-pound Martian wrestler. 
Halloway supposed that it was a truant officer and promptly kicked him in the face. Then he knocked down another guy, working furiously at the buttons of a paralysis machine which looked, to Halloway, like a popcorn wagon, after which two gigantic black Martian leopards were attacked, resembling to him nothing more than two very bad drivers in dark automobiles. Halloway sidestepped. The two cars crashed and tore each other apart, fighting. Halloway pumped on, shooting people with his flashlight, which he retrieved from the popcorn man. Pointing the flash at people, he was amazed when they vanished, and— Uh-oh! Holloway's waking up. I saw his eyelids flicker. Quiet, everyone. Holloway, you're awake? Yeah. I've been listening to you talk for five minutes. I still don't understand. Nothing happened at all. How long have I been asleep? Two days. Nothing happened, eh? Nothing except you got the Martians kowtowing, that's all, brother. Your spectacular performance impressed people. The enemy suddenly decided that if one Earthman could do what you did, what would happen if a million more came? Everybody keeps on with this joking, this lying about Mars. Stop it. Where am I? Aboard the rocket, about to take off. Leave Earth? No, no, I don't want to leave Earth. Good green Earth. Let go, I'm afraid. Let go of me. Stop the ship. Halloway, this is Mars. We're going back to Earth. Liars, all of you! I don't want to go to Mars, I want to stay here on Earth. Holy cow, here we go again. Hold him down, Gus. Hey, doctor, on the double. Come help Holloway change his mind back, will ya? Liars! You can't do this! Liars! Liars! The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Mightiest Corn by Keith Lorma Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction in July 1963 Narrated by Tom Trissel Sly, brave and truculent, the corn held all humans in contempt except one. Ambassador Nitworth glowered across his mirror-polished nine-foot platinum desk at his assembled staff. "'Gentlemen, are any of you familiar with a race known as the Corn?' There was a moment of profound silence. Nitworth leaned forward, looking solemn. "'They were a warlike race known in this sector back in Concordia times, perhaps two hundred years ago. They vanished as suddenly as they had appeared. There was no record of where they went.' He paused for effect. They have now reappeared, occupying the inner planet of this system. But, sir, Second Secretary Magnan offered, that's uninhabited terrestrial territory. Indeed, Mr. Magnan, Nitworth smiled icily. It appears the Corn't do not share that opinion. He plucked a heavy parchment from a folder before him, harumphed, and read aloud. His Supreme Excellency the Corn, Regent of Corn, Overlord of the Galactic Destiny, greets the Terrestrials, and, with reference to the presence in mandated territory of terrestrial squatters, has the honour to advise that he will require the use of his outer world on the thirtieth day. Then will the Corn come with steel and fire. Receive, Terrestrials, renewed assurances of my awareness of your existence, and let those who dare gird for the contest. "'Frankly, I wouldn't call it conciliatory,' Magnan said. Nitworth tapped the paper with a finger. "'We have been served, gentlemen, with nothing less than an ultimatum.' "'Well, we'll soon straighten those fellows out,' the military attaché began. "'There happens to be more to this piece of truculence than appears on the surface,' the ambassador cut in. He paused, waiting for interested frowns to settle into place. Note, gentlemen, that these invaders have appeared on terrestrial-controlled soil, and without so much as a flicker from the instruments of the Navigational Monitor Service. The military attaché blinked. That's absurd, he said flatly. Nitworth slapped the table. We're up against something new, gentlemen. I've considered every hypothesis from cloaks of invisibility to time travel. The fact is, the Corn't fleets are indetectable. The military attaché pulled at his lower lip. "'In that case, 
We can't try conclusions with these fellows until we have an indetectable drive our own. I recommend a crash project. In the meantime... I'll have my boys start in to crack this thing, the chief of the confidential terrestrial source section spoke up. I'll fit out a couple of volunteers with plastic beaks. No cloak and dagger work, gentlemen. Long-range policy will be worked out by deep-think teams back at the department. Our role will be a holding action. Now I want suggestions for a comprehensive, well-rounded and decisive course for meeting this threat. Any recommendation? The political officer placed his fingertips together. What about a stiff note demanding an extra week's time? No, no begging, the economic officer objected. I'd say a calm, dignified, aggressive withdrawal as soon as possible. We don't want to give them the idea we spook easily, the military attaché said. Let's delay the withdrawal, say, until tomorrow. Early tomorrow, Magnan said, or maybe later today. Well, I see you're of a mind with me, Nitworth nodded. Our plan of action is clear, but it remains to be implemented. We have a population of over 15 million individuals to relocate. He eyed the political officer. I want five proposals for resettlement on my desk by 0800 hours tomorrow. Nitworth rapped out instructions. Harried-looking staff members arose and hurried from the room. Magnan eased toward the door. Where are you going, Magnan? Nitworth snapped. Since you're so busy, I thought I'd just slip back down to Comink. It's a most interesting orientation lecture, Mr. Ambassador. Be sure to let us know how it works out. Kindly return to your chair, Nitworth said coldly. A number of chores remain to be assigned. I think you, Magnan, need a little field experience. I want you to get over to Rule It One and take a look at these quant personally. Magnan's mouth opened and closed soundlessly. Not afraid of a few quant, are you, Magnan? Afraid? Good Lord, no! Ha ha! It's just that I'm afraid I may lose my head and do something rash if I go. Nonsense! A diplomat is immune to heroic impulses. Take Retief along. No dawdling now. I want you on the way in two hours. Notify the transport pool at once. Now get going. Magnan nodded unhappily and went into the hall. Oh, Retief, Nitworth said. Retief turned. Try to restrain Mr. Magnan from any impulsive moves in any direction. Retief and Magnan topped a ridge and looked down across a slope of towering tree shrubs and glossy violet-stemmed palms set among flamboyant blossoms of yellow and red, reaching down to a strip of white beach with the blue sea beyond. A delightful vista, Magnan said, mopping at his face. A pity we couldn't locate the court. We'll go back now and report. I'm pretty sure the settlement is off to the right, Retief said. Why don't you head back for the boat? while I ease over and see what I can observe. Retief, we're engaged in a serious mission. This is not a time to think of sightseeing. I'd like to take a good look at what we're giving away. See here, Retief, one might almost receive the impression that you're questioning core policy. <laughs> one might at that. The court have made their play, but I think it might be valuable to take a look at their cards before we fold. If I'm not back at the boat in an hour, lift without me. You expect me to make my way back alone? It's directly down slope, Retief broke off, listening. Magnan clutched at his arm. There was a sound of crackling foliage. Twenty feet ahead, a leafy branch swung aside. An eight-foot biped stepped into view, long, thin, green-clad legs with back-bending knees, moving in quick, bird-like steps. A pair of immense black lensed goggles covering staring eyes set among bushy green hair above a great bone-white beak. The crest bobbed as the creature cocked his head, listening. Magnan gulped audibly. The court froze. Head tilted, beak aimed directly at the spot where the terrestrial stood in the deep shade of a giant trunk. "'I'll go for help,' Magnan squeaked. He whirled and took three leaps into the brush. A second great green-clad figure rose up to block his way. He spun, darted to the left. The first court pounced, grappled Magnan to his narrow chest. Magnan yelled, threshing and kicking, broke free, turned, and collided with an eight-foot alien coming in fast from the right. 
all three went down in a tangle of limbs. Retief jumped forward, hauled Magnum free, thrust him aside, and stopped, right fist cocked. The two caught lay groaning feebly. "'Nice piece of work, Mr. Magnan,' Retief said. "'You nailed both of them.' "'Those undoubtedly are the most bloodthirsty, aggressive, merciless countenances it ever been my misfortune to encounter,' Magnan said. "'It hardly seems fair. Eight feet tall, and faces like that.' The smaller of the two captive caught ran long, slender fingers over a bony shin, from which he had turned back the tight-fitting green trousers. "'It's not broken,' he whistled nasally in passable terrestrial, eyeing Magnan through the heavy goggles now badly cracked. "'Small thanks to you.' Magnan smiled loftily. "'I dare say you'll think twice before interfering with peaceable diplomats in future.' "'Diplomats? Surely you jest.' "'Never mind us,' Retief said. "'It's you fellows we'd like to talk about. "'How many of you are there?' "'Only Zab and myself.' "'I mean altogether. How many quant? "'The alien whistled shrilly. "'Here, no signalling. Magnan snapped, looking around. "'That was merely an expression of amusement.' "'You find the situation amusing? "'I assure you, sir, you are in perilous straits at the moment.' I may fly into another rage, you know. Please restrain yourself. I was merely somewhat astonished, a small whistle escaped, at being taken for a quant. Aren't you a quant? I? Great snail trails, no! More stifled whistles of amusement escaped the beaked face. Both Zab and I are verp, naturalists, as it happens. You certainly look like quant. Oh, not at all except perhaps to a terrestrial. The court are sturdily built rascals, all over ten feet in height, and, of course, they do nothing but quarrel. A drone caste, actually. A caste? You mean they're biologically the same as you? Not at all. A verp wouldn't think of fertilising a quant. I mean to say you're of the same basic stock, descended from a common ancestor, perhaps. We are all Pad's creatures. What are the differences between you, then? By the court are argumentary, boastful, lacking in appreciation for the finer things of life. One dreads to contemplate descending to their level. Do you know anything about a note passed to the terrestrial ambassador at Smallbrod? Retief asked. The beak twitched. Smallbrod? I know of no place called Smallbrod. The outer planet of this system. Oh, yes, we call it Guzm. I had heard that some sort of creatures had established a settlement there, but I confess I play little note to such matters. "'We're wasting time, Retief, Magnan said. "'We must truss these chaps up, hurry back to the boat, and make our escape. You heard what they said?' "'Are there any court down there at the harbour where the boats are?' Retief asked. "'At Taroon, you mean? Oh, yes, planning some adventure.' "'That would be the invasion of Smallbrod,' Magnan said. "'and unless we hurry, Retief, we're likely to be caught there with the last of the evacuees.' "'How many court would you say there are at Taroon?' "'Oh, a very large number. Perhaps fifteen or twenty. Fifteen or twenty what?' Magnan looked perplexed. Fifteen or twenty court. "'You mean that there are only fifteen or twenty individual court in all?' "'Another whistle. Not at all. I was referring to the local court only.' There are more of the other centres, of course. And the court are responsible for the ultimatum, unilaterally? I suppose so. It sounds like them. A truculent group, you know. And interplanetary relations are rather a hobby of theirs. Zub moaned and stirred. He sat up slowly, rubbing his head. He spoke to his companion in a shrill alien clatter of consonants. What did he say? Poor Zub. He blames me for his bruises, since it, was, since it was my idea to gather you as specimens. "'You should have known better than to tackle that fierce-looking creature,' Zub said, pointing his beak at Magnan. "'How does it happen that you speak terrestrial?' Retief asked. "'Oh, one picks up all sorts of dialects.' "'It's quite charming, really,' Magnan said. "'Such a quaint, archaic accent.' "'Suppose we went down to Taroon,' Retief asked. What kind of reception would we get? 
That depends. I wouldn't recommend interfering with the guild or the rook. It's their nest-mending time, you know. The boog will be busy mating. Such a tedious business. And of course the court are tied up with their ceremonial feasting. I'm afraid no one will take any notice of you. Do you mean to say, Magdalene Monk demanded, that these ferocious court who have issued an ultimatum to the corpse diplomatique terrestrienne, who openly avow their occupied world, would ignore terrestrials in their midst? If at all possible. Retief got to his feet. I think our course is clear, Mr. Magnan. It's up to us to go down and attract a little attention. I'm not at all sure we're going about this in the right way, Magnan puffed, trotting at Retief's side. These fellows, Zub and Slun, oh, they seem affable enough, but how can we be sure we're not being led into a trap? We can't. Magnan stopped short. Let's go back. All right, Retief said. Of course, there may be an ambush. Magnan moved off. Let's keep going. The party emerged from the undergrowth at the edge of a great brush-grown mound. Slun took the lead, rounded the flank of the hillock, halted at a rectangular opening cut into the slope. "'You can find your way easily enough from here,' he said. "'You'll excuse us, I hope.' "'Nonsense, Slun,' Zub pushed forward. "'I'll escort our guests to Court Hall,' he twittered briefly to his fellow Verp. Slun twittered back. "'I don't like it, Retief,' Magnan whispered. "'Those fellows are plotting mischief.' Threatened them with violence, Mr. Magnan. They're scared of you. That's true, and the drubbing they received was well deserved. I'm a patient man, but there are occasions. Come along, please, Zub called. Another ten minutes walk. See here, we have no interest in investigating this barrow, Magnan announced. We wish you to take us direct to Tarun to have an interview with the military leaders regarding the ultimatum. Yes, yes, of course. Court Hall lies here inside the village. This is Tarun? A modest civic centre, sir, but there are those who love it. No wonder we didn't observe their works from the air, Magnan muttered, camouflaged. He moved hesitantly through the opening. The party moved along a wide, deserted tunnel which sloped down steeply, then levelled off and branched. Zub took the centre branch ducking slightly under the nine-foot ceiling lit at intervals with what appeared to be primitive incandescent panels. Few signs of an advanced technology here, Magnan whispered. These creatures must devote all their talents to warlike enterprise. Ahead, Zub slowed. A distant susurration was audible, a sustained high-pitched screeching. Softly now, we approach Court Hall, they can be an irascible lot when disturbed at their feasting. "'When will the feast be over?' Magnan called hoarsely. "'In another few weeks, I should imagine, if, as you say, they've scheduled an invasion for the next month.' "'Look here, Zab,' Magnan shook a finger at the tall alien. "'How is it that these court are allowed to embark on piratical ventures of this sort without reference to the wishes of the majority?' Oh, the majority of the court favour the move, I imagine. These few hotheads are permitted to embroil the planet in war? Oh, they don't embroil the planet in war. They merely... Retief, this is fantastic. I've heard of iron-fisted military cliques before, but this is madness. Come softly now, Zub beckoned, moving toward a bend in the yellow-lit corridor. Retief and Magnon moved forward. The corridor debouched through a high double door into a vast oval chamber, high-domed, gloomy, panelled in dark wood, and hung with tattered banners, scarred halberds, pikes, rusted longswords, crossed spears over patterned hauberks, pitted radiation armour, corroded power rifles, the immense mummified heads of horned and fanged animals great guttering torches in wall brackets and in stands along the length of the long table shed a smoky light that reflected from the mirror polish of the red granite floor gleamed on polished silver bowls and paper-thin glass shone jewel red and gold through dark bottles and cast long flickering shadows behind the fifteen trolls at the board lesser trolls beaked bush-haired great-eyed trotted briskly bird-kneed bearing steaming platters, stood in groups of three strumming slender bottle-shaped lutes, or pranced an intricate patterned dance 
unnoticed in the shrill uproar as each of the magnificently draped, belted, feathered, and jewelled court carried on a shouted conversation with an equally noisy fellow. A most interesting display of barbaric splendour, Magnan breathed. Now we'd better be getting back. Ah, a moment, Zub said. Observe the court, the tallest of the feasters, he with a headdress of crimson, purple, silver, and pink. Twelve feet if he's, if he's an inch, Magnan estimated. And now we really must hurry along. That one is chief among those rowdies. I'm sure you'll want a word with him. He controls not only the Terunian vessels, but those from the other centres as well. What kind of vessels? Warships? Certainly. What other kind would the Quant bother with? I don't suppose, Magnan said casually, that you'd know the type, tonnage, armament, and manning of these vessels? And how many units comprise the fleet, and where they're based at present? They're fully automated twenty-thousand-ton all-purpose dreadnoughts. They mount a variety of weapons. The Quant are fond of that sort of thing. Each of the Quant has its own, of course. They're virtually identical, except for the personal touches each individual has given his ship. Great heavens, Retief! Magnan exclaimed in a whisper. It sounds as though these brutes employ a battle armada as simpler souls might a set of toy sailboats. Retief stepped past Magnan and Zub to study the feasting hall. I can see that their votes would carry all the necessary weight. And now an interview with the corn himself, Zub shrilled. If you'll kindly step along, gentlemen. Uh, that won't be necessary, Magnan said hastily. I've decided to refer the matter to committee. After having come so far, Zub said, it would be a pity to miss having a cosy chat. There was a pause. Ah, uh, Retief, Magnan said. Zub has just presented a most compelling argument. Retief turned. Zub stood gripping an ornately decorated power pistol in one bony hand, a slim needler in the other. Both were pointed at Magnan's chest. I suspected you had hidden qualities, Zub, Retief commented. See here, Zub, with diplomats, Magnan started. Careful, Mr. Magnan, you may go them into a frenzy. By no means, Zub whistled. I much prefer to observe the frenzy of the court when presented with the news that two peaceful verp have been assaulted and kidnapped by bullying interlopers. If there's anything that annoys the court, it's court-like behaviour in others. Now step along, please. Rest assured, this will be reported. I doubt it. You'll face the wrath of enlightened galactic opinion. Oh, how big a navy does enlightened galactic opinion have? Stop scaring him, Mr. Magnan. He may get nervous and shoot. Retief stepped into the banquet hall, headed for the resplendent figure at the head of the table. A trio of flute players broke off in mid bleat, staring. An inverted pyramid of tumblers blinked as Retief swung past, followed by Magnan and the tall verp. The shrill chatter at the table faded. Corn turned as Retief came up, blinking three inch eyes. Zub stepped forward, gibbered, waving his arms excitedly. Corn pushed back his chair, a low, heavy padded stool, and stared unwinking at Retief, moving his head to bring first one great round eye, then the other to bear. There were small blue veins in the immensely fleshy beak, the bushy hair springing out in a giant halo around the greyish, porous skinned face was wiry, stiff, moss green with tufts of chartreuse fuzz surrounding what appeared to be tympanic membranes. The tall headdress of scarlet silk and purple feathers was slightly askew, and a loop of pink pearls had slipped down above one eye. Zub finished his speech and fell silent, breathing hard. Korn looked Retief over in silence, then belched. Not bad, Retief said admiringly. Maybe we could get up a match between you and Ambassador Sternwheeler. You've got the volume on him, but he's got Tamba. So, Corn hooted in a resonant tenor, you come from Guzzam, eh? Or Smallbrod, as I think you call it. What is it you're after? More time? A compromise? Negotiations? Peace? He slammed a bony hand against the table. The answer is no! Zub twittered. 
corn cocked an eye, motioned to a servant. Chain that one, indicated Magnan. His eyes went to Retief. This one's bigger. You'd best chain him, too. Why, Your Excellency, Magnan started, stepping forward. Stay back, Corn hooted. Stand over there where I can keep an eye on you. Your Excellency, I'm empowered. Not here, you're not, Corn trumpeted. Want peace, do you? Well, I don't want peace. I've had a surfeit of peace these last two centuries. I want action, loot, adventure, glory. He turned to look down the table. How about it, fellows? It's war to the knife, eh? There was a momentary silence from all sides. I guess so, grunted a giant corn in iridescent blue with flame-coloured plumes. Corn's eyes bulged. He half rose. We've been all over this, he bassooned. He clamped bony fingers on the hilt of a light rapier. I thought I'd made my point. Oh, sure, Corn. You bet. I'm convinced. Corn rumbled and resumed his seat. All for one, and one for all. That's us. And you're the one, eh, Corn? Retief commented. Magnan cleared his throat. I sense that some of you gentlemen are not convinced of the wisdom of this move, he piped looking along the table at the silks, jewels, beaks, feather-decked crests, and staring eyes. Silence, Corn hooted. No use your talking to my loyal lieutenants anyway, he added. They do whatever I convince them they ought to do. But I'm sure that on more mature consideration— I can lick any corn in the house, Corn said. That's why I'm Corn, he belched again. A servant came up staggering under a weight of chain, dropped it with a crash at Magnan's feet. Zab aimed the guns while the servant wrapped three loops around Magnan's wrists, snapped a lock in place. "'You next!' the guns pointed at Retief's chest. He held out his arms. Four loops of silvery-grey chain in half-inch links dropped around them. The servant cinched them up tight, squeezed the lock through the ends, and closed it. "'Now,' Corn said, lolling back in his chair, glass in hand, "'there's a bit of sport to be had here, lads.' What shall we do with them? Let them go, the blue and flame corn said glumly. You can do better than that, corn hooted. Now here's a suggestion. We carve them up a little, lop off the external labia and pinnae, I say, and ship them back. Good Lord, Retief, he's talking about cutting off our ears and sending us home mutilated. What a barbaric proposal! It wouldn't be the first time a terrestrial diplomat got a trimming, Retief commented. It should have the effect of stimulating the Terries to put up a reasonable scrap, Corn said judiciously. I have a feeling that they're thinking of giving up without a struggle. Oh, I doubt that, the blue and flame Corn said. Why should they? Corn rolled an eye at Retief and another at Magnan. Take these two, he hooted. I'll wager they came here to negotiate a surrender. "'Well,' Magnan started. "'Hold it, Mr. Magnan,' Retief said. "'I'll tell him.' "'What's your proposal?' Corn whistled, taking a gulp from his goblet. "'A fifty-fifty split? Monetary reparations? Alternate territory? I can assure you it's useless. We can't like to fight.' "'I'm afraid you've gotten the wrong impression, Your Excellency,' Retief said blandly. "'We didn't come to negotiate.' We came to deliver an ultimatum. What? Corn trumpeted. Behind Retief, Magnan spluttered. We plan to use this planet for target practice, Retief said. A new type hell bomb we've worked out. Have all your people off of it in seventy-two hours, or suffer the consequences. You have the gall, Corn stormed, to stand here in the centre of Corn Hall, uninvited at that, and in chains— Oh, these, Retief said. He tensed his arms. The soft aluminium links stretched and broke. He shook the light metal free. We diplomats like to go along with colourful local customs, but I wouldn't want to mislead you. Now, as to the evacuation of Rulit for one. Zub screeched, waved the guns. The court were jabbering. I told you they were brutes, Zub shrilled. Corn slammed his fist down on the table. I don't care what they are, he honked. Evacuate hell. I can field eighty-five combat-ready ships. 
and we can englobe every one of them with a thousand peace enforcers with a hundred megatons second firepower each. Retief, Magnan tugged at his sleeve, don't forget their superdrive. That's all right, they don't have one. But we'll take you on, corn French horned. We're on the corn. We glory in battle. We live in fame or go down in. Hogwash, the flame and blue corn cut in. If it wasn't for you, corn, we could sit around and feast and brag and enjoy life without having to prove anything. Corn, you seem to be the firebrand here, Retief said. I think the rest of the boys would listen to reason. Over my dead body. My idea exactly, Retief said. You claim you can lick any man in the house. Unwind yourself from your ribbons and step out here on the floor, and we'll see how good you are at backing up your conversation. Magnan hovered at Retief's side. Twelve feet tall, he moaned, and did you notice the size of those hands? Retief watched as Corn's aides helped him out of his formal trappings. I wouldn't worry too much, Mr. Magnan. This is a light G world. I doubt if old Corn would weigh up at more than two fifty standard pounds here. But that phenomenal reach! I'll peck away at him at knee level. When he bends over to swat me, I'll get a crack at him. Across the cleared floor, Corn shook off his helpers with a snort. Enough! Let me at the upstart! Retief moved out to meet him, watching the upraised backward jointing arms. Corn stalked forward, long lean legs bent, long horny feet clacking against the polished floor. The other aliens, both servitors and bejeweled court, formed a wide circle, all eyes unwaveringly on the combatants. Corn struck suddenly, a long arm flashing down in a vicious cut at Retief, who leaned aside, caught one lean shank below the knee. Corn bent to halt Retief from his leg, and staggered back as a haymaker took him just below the beak. A screech went up from the crowd as Retief leaped clear. Corn hissed and charged. Retief whirled aside, then struck the alien's off-leg in a flying tackle. Corn leaned, arms windmilling, crashed to the floor. Retief whirled, dived for the left arm, whipped it behind the narrow back, seized Corn's neck in a stranglehold, and threw his weight backward. Corn fell on his back. His legs squatted out at an awkward angle. He squawked and beat his free arm on the floor, reaching in vain for Retief. Zub stepped forward, pistols ready. Magnan stepped before him. Need I remind you, sir, he said icily, that this is an official diplomatic function. I can brook no interference from disinterested parties. Zub hesitated. Magnan held out a hand. I must ask you to hand me your weapons, Zub. Look here, Zub began. I may lose my temper, Magnan hinted. Zub lowered the guns, passed them to Magnan. He thrust him into his belt with a sour smile, turned back to watch the encounter. Retief had thrown a turn of violet silk around Corn's left wrist, bound it to the alien's neck. Another wisp of stuff floated from Corn's shoulder. Retief, still holding Corn in an awkward sprawl, wrapped it around one outflung leg, trussed ankle and thigh together. Corn flopped, hooting. At each movement, the constricting loop around his neck jerked his head back the green crest tossing wildly. "'If I were you, I'd relax,' Retief said, rising and releasing his grip. Corn got a leg under him. Retief kicked it. Corn's chin hit the floor with a hollow clack. He wilted, an ungainly tangle of overlong limbs and gay silks. Retief turned to the watching crowd. "'Next!' he called. The blue and flame Corn stepped forward. Maybe this would be a good time to elect a new leader, he said. Now my qualifications. Sit down, Retief said loudly. He stepped to the head of the table, seated himself in Corn's vacated chair. A couple of you finished trussing Corn up for me. But we must elect a leader. That won't be necessary, boys. I'm your new leader. As I see it, Retief said, dribbling cigar ashes into an empty wine glass. You can't like to be warriors, but you don't particularly like to fight. We don't mind a little fighting, within reason, and of course, as can't, we're expected to die in battle. But what I say is, why rush things? 
"'I have a suggestion,' Magnan said. "'Why not turn the reins of government over to the Verp? They seem a level-headed group.' "'What good would that do? Caunt our caunt. It seems there's always one among us who is a slave to instinct, and naturally we have to follow him. Why? Because that's the way it's done. Why not do it another way? Magnan offered. Now I'd like to suggest community singing. If we gave up fighting, we might live too long. Then what would happen? Live too long? Magnan looked puzzled. When estimating time comes, there'll be no burrow for us. Anyway, with a new court stepping on our heels. I've lost the thread, Magnan said. Who are the new court? After estivated, the verp molt, and then their court, of course. The gwill become boog, the boog become rook, and the rook metamorphosize into verp. You mean slun and zub, the mild natured naturalists, will become warmongers like quorn? Very likely. The milder the verp, the wilder the corn as the old saying goes. "'What do Kaunt turn into?' Retief asked. "'Hmm, that's a good question. So far none have survived Kaunthood.' "'Have you thought of forsaking a warlike ways?' Magnan asked. "'What about taking up sheep-herding and regular church attendance?' "'Don't mistake me. We Kaunt like a military life. It's great sport to sit around roaring fires and drink and tell lies, and then go dashing off to enjoy a brisk affray and some leisurely looting afterward. But we prefer a nice numerical advantage. Not this business of tackling your terrestrials over on Guzzam. That was a mad notion. We had no idea what your strength was. But now that's all off, of course, Magnan chirped. Now that we've had diplomatic relations and all. Oh, by no means. The fleet lifts in thirty days. After all, we quant. We have to satisfy our drive to action. But Mr. Retief is your leader now. He won't let you. Only a dead quant stays home when attack day comes. And even if he orders us all to cut our own throats, there are still the other centres, all with their own leaders. No, gentlemen, the invasion is definitely on. Why don't you go invade somebody else? Magnum suggested. I could name some very attractive prospects, outside my sector, of course. Hold everything, Retief said. I think we've got the basis of a deal here. At the head of a double column of gaudily caparisoned court, Retief and Magnan strolled across the ramp toward the bright tower of the CDT sector HQ. Ahead, gates opened, and a black core limousine emerged, flying an ambassadorial flag under a plain square of white. Curious, Magnan commented. I wonder what the significance of the white ensign might be. Retief raised a hand. The column halted with a clash of recruitments and a rasp of quaunt boots. Retief looked back along the line. The high white sun flashed on bright silks, polished buckles, deep dyed plumes, butts of pistols, the soft gleam of leather. A brave show indeed, Magnan commented approvingly. I confess the idea has merit. The limousine pulled up with a squeal of brakes, stood on two fat tired wheels, and gyros humming softly. The hatch popped up. A portly diplomat stepped out. Why, Ambassador Nitworth, Magnan glowed, this is very kind of you. Keep cool, Magnan, Nitworth said in a strained voice. We'll attempt to get you out of this. He stepped past Magnan's outstretched hand and looked hesitantly at the ramrod straight line of Kaunt, eighty-five strong, and beyond at the eighty-five tall Kaunt dreadnoughts. "'Good afternoon, sir. Ah, Your Excellency,' Nitworth said, blinking up at the leading Kaunt. "'You are commander of the strike force, I assume?' "'Nope,' the Kaunt said shortly. "'I uh, wish to request seventy-two hours in which to evacuate headquarters,' Nitworth ploughed on. "'Mr. Ambassador,' Retief said, this don't panic retief i'll attempt to secure your release nitworth hissed over his shoulder now you will address our leader with more respect the tall court hooted eyeing nitworth ominously from eleven feet up uh, uh, yes indeed sir your excellency commander now about the invasion mr secretary magnan tugged at nitworth's leave in heaven's name permit me to negotiate in peace nitworth snapped he rearranged his features 
Now, Your Excellency, we've arranged to evacuate Smallbroad, of course, just as you requested. Requested? The Count honked. Art demanded, that is, quite rightly, of course, ordered, instructed, and, of course, we'll be only too pleased to follow any other instructions you might have. You don't quite get the big picture, Mrs. Secretary, Retief said. This isn't— Silence, confound you, Nitworth barked. The leading Count looked at Retief. He nodded. Two bony hands shot out, seized Nitworth, and stuffed a length of bright pink silk into his mouth, then spun him around and held him facing Retief. "'If you don't mind my taking this opportunity to brief you, Mr. Ambassador,' Retief said blandly, "'I think I should mention that this isn't an invasion fleet. These are the new recruits for the Peace Enforcement Corps.' Magnan stepped forward, glanced at the gag in Ambassador Nitworth's mouth, hesitated, then cleared his throat. "'We felt,' he said, "'that the establishment of a foreign brigade within the P.E. Corps structure "'would provide the element of novelty the Department has requested in our recruiting, "'and at the same time would remove the stigma of terrestrial chauvinism "'from future punitive operations.' Nitworth stared, eyes bulging. "'He grunted, reaching for the gag, caught the corn's eye on him, "'dropped his hands to his side. "'I suggest we get the troops in out of the hot sun,' Retief said. Magnan edged close. "'What about the gag?' he whispered. "'Let's leave it where it is for a while,' Retief murmured. "'It may save us a few concessions.' An hour later, Nitworth, breathing freely again, glowered across his deck at Retief and Magnan. "'This entire affair,' he rumbled, "'has made me appear to be a fool.' "'But we who are privileged to serve on your staff already know just how clever you are,' Magnan burbled. Nitworth purpled. "'You're skirting insolence, Magnan,' he roared. "'Why was I not informed of the arrangements? What was I to assume at the sight of eighty-five war vessels over my headquarters unannounced?' "'We tried to get through, but our wavelengths—' "'Bah! Sterner souls and I would have quailed at the spectacle.' "'Oh, you were perfectly justified in panicking.' "'I did not panic!' Nitworth bellowed. "'I am merely adjusted to the apparent circumstances. "'Now I am of two minds as to the advisability of this foreign legion idea of yours. "'Still, it may have merit. "'I believe the wisest course would be to dispatch them to a long training cruise "'in an uninhabited sector of space.' "'The office windows rattled. "'What the devil!' Nitworth turned, staring out at the ramp "'where a corned ship rose slowly on a column of pale blue light. "'The vibration increased as a second ship lifted, then a third. Nitworth whirled on Magnan. "'What's this? Who ordered these recruits to embark without my permission?' "'I took the liberty of giving them an errand to run, Mr. Secretary,' Retief said. "'There was that little matter of the Groaki infiltrating the Cyrenian system. I sent the boys off to handle it. Call them back at once. I'm afraid that won't be possible. They're under orders to maintain total communication silence until completion of the mission.' Nitworth drummed his fingers on the desktop. Slowly, a thoughtful expression dawned. He nodded. "'This may work out,' he said. "'I should call them back, but since the fleet is out of contact, I'm unable to do so, correct? Thus I can hardly be held responsible for any over-enthusiasm in chastising the Groaki.' He closed one eye in a broad wink at Magnan. "'Very well, gentlemen. I'll overlook the irregularity this time.' "'Magnan, see to it that the Smurbrodian public are notified they can remain where they are. And, by the way, did you by any chance discover the technique of the indetectable drive the court used?' "'No, sir. That is, yes, sir.' "'Well, well?' "'There isn't any. The court were there all the time, underground.' "'Underground? Doing what?' "'Hibernating. For two hundred years at a stretch.' The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!